American politics, the indelible system under which millions of people casually decide whether or not they want to be free. Tonight's story takes place over a hundred years ago in what historians call history. It's about the creation of the teddy bear, named in honor of President Teddy Theodore Simon Alvin Roosevelt. But more importantly, it's about the invention of the failed follow-up to Teddy, named Billy, after America's first bovine president, William Howard Taft. See, the toy companies were worried that kids wouldn't want teddy bears after Teddy left office. And yet they're beloved around the world to this day, whereas the disastrous sequel has been all but forgotten from history. Until now, the year is 1909. The White House is infested. And Billy Possum is coming to town. See you again after the closing credits. The boy held his precious teddy bear close, as he had done for as long as he could remember. The only reason it didn't look more worn was his nanny who cleaned it and mended its seams on countless occasions. But tonight, young Charlie was clutching his teddy bear closer than ever. He could feel the walls closing in. Everything was changing around him, and he feared he may lose his best friend forever. How about this? How about you keep both of them with you tonight? Then you will have the love and protection of both your little friends. How does that sound, love? No. Bessie understood. For years now, she had put her needle and her heart into that bear. She loved him almost as much as Charlie did. But she had her instructions, and they were emphatic. Well then, how about I just leave him at the end of your bed? Off in the distance, like, so you can't really see him very well. Uh, that's all right, isn't it? She placed the doll at the foot of the bed. The enormous sleeping structure was much more than an 11-year-old boy required. The toy was so far away, he could hardly see it. No. Please, Nanny, I don't want it on the bed. Uh, well, well, how about I just pop him over there? Uh, on the dresser at the far end of the room, hmm? I could put him next to that funny old chamber pot. I is that acceptable? No, he mustn't be in the room. He mustn't be anywhere near me. He's evil. Evil? No, never. He's not evil. Not literally evil. Not in the biblical sense, mind. He's just different. That's all. We're all a little different. I'm different. I speak funny, don't I? I I've come all the way from the United Kingdom. A proper kingdom. We've got a king and all. Not like your fine presidents. I'm a little different. And this fella here, he's a little different as well. Oh, just give him a chance. I'm certain you'll warm up to him in time. No, I never will. Oh, Master Charlie, please. This means so much to your father. Keep that monstrosity away from me! It's evil, I tell you! It wishes me harm! Harm? Nonsense! Who's filling your head with such notions? Teddy told me. No oh, love, really. They're just dolls. They don't talk! Teddy protects me. He's always protected me. He always will. Not your father! Stop my father! And Charlie snatched the offending doll from her hands and hurled it at the door. The discussion was over. Charlie turned on his side, his cold shoulder erected as a fortress against compromise. Bessie hung her head low. 
her mission having failed. Once again, she stood retreating in defeat with only a stop to stoop and scoop the discarded toy from the floor. Oh dear, dear, whatever will I tell his father? Oh, heavens me! Bessie knew when he was approaching, everyone did. The floorboards cried out like wounded animals. The hallway darkened as one end was eclipsed by a singular daunting figure. The man of the house himself. Where is the bear? William Howard Taft. The newly inaugurated President of the United States of America. Oh, sir. He won't give it up. He loves it so. Hmm. And Billy? Why do you still possess Billy? Oh, Mr. President, sir. It's like I say. He won't take it. He hates it, he does. He threw it at the door. I see. The little tornado strikes again. No, sir, if I may. This is no mere temper tantrum. He's afraid of this thing. Proper fearful he is. He says it's wicked, evil. He won't have it in the same room. But why? It's a perfectly acceptable replacement. One doll is as good as any other. Simply take the bear and give him Billy. Oh, but sir, he's had that teddy bear since he was a dog. He loves it so. Loves it? It's a toy. Just bits of cloth stuffed with wool. Teddy bear is far more than that, Mr. President. To Charlie, that is. He loves that bear. Says it protects him. He even says it speaks to him. Speaks to him? The bear speaks to him. Uh, yes, sir. I uh, believe so, yes, sir. Baller dash. All this rot over a raggedy old toy bear. I'll never give you away, Teddy. I promise. Bully for you, my fine boy. Bully for you. I tell you, there's something sinister about that furry scoundrel. Demonic, even. And I'll fight tooth and nail to thwart his incursion. Yes, I shall cry belly ho and we shall charge. But what if they take you away from me? Oh, pish, pish, I say. The devil himself may remand the soul. But for you, my boy, I shall find a way. Yes, never fear. Never fear. But I do fear. I'm so afraid. Oh, now, don't lose courage, son. Things always take a turn for the better in the end. You'll see. Oh, Teddy. I'm scared of losing you. Scared of moving in this new house. Scared of... Charlie, I trust you're enjoying a pleasant evening. Charlie didn't answer. He knew why his father was here. He could see what he was clutching in his massive paw. How are you finding it? Living in the White House, that is. It's quite drafty. Yes, yes, I suppose it is. The president sat at the edge of the bed. The stuffing shifted, elevating his son. Still, at least you've the advantage of having already lived here in D.C. Most presidential sons must move far away and lose all their friends. But my friends are Quentin and Kermit and Theodore, and they've all moved back to New York. Oh, oh yes. I apologize. Quentin, Kermit, and Theodore were the sons of Taft's predecessor, President Theodore Teddy Roosevelt. Charismatic adventurer, conservationist, author, boxer, war hero, monopoly buster, fair labor reformer, union protector, father of the U.S. Navy, Nobel Peace Prize winner, the man who punched a hole between two oceans. Someone so pure in his political intentions, he became president in the only way possible. Pure dumb luck. After two highly successful terms in office, he magnanimously declined a third, instead handing over the reins of his party to his Secretary of War, William Howard Taft. But the friendship rapidly disintegrated when it became apparent that Taft wouldn't adhere to his promises. His administration immediately pivoted away from the progressive wing and instead leaned into conservative cronyism and big business capitulation. Now the two men were locked in a battle for the soul of their party and Roosevelt's public popularity was casting a long shadow. I see you still have that old bear. It is a very fine bear, I'll concede that point. 
excellent craftsmanship. He's got a funny little face. Yes, of course he does. Of course he does. But then, what about this face? Billy Possum was aimed at Charlie, who recoiled at the sight. The edges of the creature's mouth were pulled unnaturally into a rictus grin, displaying an impossible multitude of tiny, jagged, mismatched teeth. The ocular sockets were pulled as well, giving the impression that the eyeballs had rolled down a snowy mountainside. The glassy black and white marbles glinted like a maniac, and pudgy little claws dangled from the chest like mittens pinned to a coat. The body was covered in fur, although the fur was not furry like a beloved pet. It was coarse and wiry like straw or rubberized horsehair. It smelled like a butcher's apron. This was less a commercially viable cuddly toy and more a taxidermy nightmare from the depths of an insane asylum. Here comes Billy Bottom! Taft bounced the animal around playfully, wafting the odor of rotten cabbages and flea eggs. Please, Father! But I'm beginning to feel quite unwell. This is just the prototype, mind. First off the line, he's much more realistic than your bear, isn't he? He certainly is. That's genuine possum fur, you know. You're quite fond of nature. This is authentic nature. A chill ran down Charlie's spine as he imagined the creature that once inhabited this abomination. He's going to become the next big fad to sweep the nation. Teddy Bear's day is over, my son. This is Billy Possum's era now. I'm very happy you've become president, Father. I'm very proud of you. And I'm honored to live here in the White House. I truly am. But I love my teddy bear. I always have and I always will. I could never trade him away for anything in the world. But Billy is so charming. And look, he can stand on his own, as one should. Your teddy can't stand. Teddy is far more charming, I should think. He comes from such charming provenance. President Roosevelt was in the woods and showed mercy to a defenseless bear. Yes, I'm aware. We're all aware of the bear story. But Billy is named after your own father, and his provenance is just as charming. No, it isn't. It simply commemorates the fact that you're willing to eat possums. That's right, son. I don't require any indulgent foodstuffs. A humble possum will suffice, and they don't harm my digestion in the slightest. Oh, I really am feeling quite ill. Now look, son, Mr. Roosevelt isn't president anymore. I am. Nobody is going to want a teddy now that Teddy is no longer in office. Teddy bears are destined to become a footnote in the dustiest of history books. But contrarywise, you could be the spearhead of the next inevitable craze. The craze for Billy Awesome. I don't believe that to be possible. Of course it is. Just look at this newspaper clipping. And this is just the start. Billy will be in children's books and songs. No one is going to write books and songs for this creature. Yes, they will. They're being paid to write them as we speak. But no one was instructed to write songs and books about teddy bears. People created them because they were inspired to do so. Well, think how much better such books and songs will be when their creators are incentivized by a handsome remuneration. But... Here comes Billy Possum now, here to fill your heart with with such and such. Father, please, I love my teddy bear. I received him when we returned from the Philippines. I don't even recall it now, but Bessie tells me so. Theodore Jr. himself gave him to me when I first met the Roosevelts. Teddy is all that I have left of my friends. Yes, yes, my child, that is quite touching. But Charlie, my boy, this is about far more than camaraderie. This is about family. Our name, our reputation, our station in history. You could carry this little chap around town and inspire others to do the same. The two of you could become a phenomenon together. Why, you play your cards right, and one day you may find yourself President of the United States. Perhaps. And heaven forbid if you should ever be seen in public with that bear. The yellow journalist would mock me no end. I know, Father. 
I never let him be seen in public, I swear. Yes, good, good. But regardless, that toy is a liability. I'm afraid it must go. No! Now, now, there'll be none of that. I'm certain we can reach some form of agreement if I simply think this through. Charlie squeezed his teddy bear close whilst suspiciously eyeing his father. The cogs of political negotiation clicked away under his monolith of mustache and meat. I have an idea. What say we give old Billy just one day to prove his worth? Just one. That's all I ask. You keep this possum on your person for a 24-hour period, commencing right this moment. After which, you can choose any little companion you like. A possum, a bear, a hippopotamus, if you please. You wish me to spend the night with that? Yes, son, please. If you could just do this for your dear old father. Tell you what, we could go to a baseball game. Or how's about we go on holiday to Beverly next week? I'll take you fishing. Oh, and pack your jodhpurs. We'll go horseback riding as well. Anything you like, if you just give this creature a day's due diligence. What about Teddy? The bear? Oh, well, I'll take the bear into my possession during said 24 hours. What will you do with him? You won't give him away, will you? You won't harm him? Harm? No, no, no. Of course not. You promise? Yes, yes, of course. Charlie looked down at Teddy. He could almost hear him, begging him not to do it, not to allow this monster in his bed. Please, son, for the family. Well... Splendid! That's decided, then. President Taft snatched the teddy bear from his son's hands. Before Charlie realized what was happening, his father sprang up. Sleep tight. Don't let the bugbears bite. Nanny Bessie listened inquisitively at the door, only picking up the occasional word or phrase. When she heard the floorboards, she stood at attention. Mr. President, you have the bear! Of course I have. Nothing to it. He'll be a new man in the morning, you'll see. I expect he'll be crying all night. Perhaps, but you mustn't mollycoddle the boy, Bessie. He needs this time alone. In fact, hand me the key to this door. Bessie obeyed. The president slid the iron key into the lock and turned it, trapping his child in the room. No one is to enter this room tonight without my expressed consent. Is that understood? Yes, Mr. President. And um, what of the bear? Uh, what if young Master Charlie should want it back tomorrow? He won't. Boys are flippant, Bessie. The lad simply needs to grow accustomed to this new addition. In a few days, he'll have forgotten all about this old bear. Here, you take the blasted thing. Me? What am I to do with it, sir? Take it to the furnace. Burn it. Billy Possum was left sitting at the edge of the bed, gazing at Charlie through bulbous cross-eyed marbles, bursting out of his wiry pate. The boy chose to ignore. Pretend the monster didn't exist. He turned over, focusing his attention on the open window. A good potential escape route, he thought. But for now, he just needed to get to sleep. He needed to be unconscious for as much of this teddyless day as he could. But he was off to a terrible start. He could barely force his eyes shut. His chest felt rigid, his stomach churned, and he kept hearing noises. <laughs> Just get to sleep. Just ignore it and get to sleep. It was becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. The hot puddle was beginning to soak Charlie's bare feet. The smell wafted up through the sheets. It had the stench of a dead vagrant soaked in whale oil. Then the thing pulled and scratched at the pillow. The very pillow Charlie's head rested upon. The hairs on the nape of his neck were pointing at the action like shocked witnesses. Feathers were fluttering now. The animal was burrowing 
into the pillow. Charlie could feel it displacing the stuffing beneath him. He knew he should sit up, but he was frozen. Frozen in fear. Frozen from the bottom of his piss-sodden toes to the top of his stunned scalp hairs. Charlie's heart was beating faster now. Ignoring the problem didn't work. The problem was now stroking his cheek with its claw through the veil of the pillowcase. Continued to claw the child's face as a distorted form of comfort. I'm gonna take care of you and tenderly wash your foot stems. I'll never let you bleed to death, Charlie. We are friends. <laughs> I will pull out your fingernails, yes. I will dip them in the sauce sauce and stuff them in my tummy pocket. Yes, I'm but only one at a time, Charlie. I only ain't got your finger cushions one at a time. Cause I love you, Charlie boy. I take you fishing. I take you horseback riding. <laughs> Back your jodbus! <laughs> you got your jodbus, Charlie? Yes. You got some? <laughs> you got them jodbus? Yes. Yes, I have my jodbus. I'm gonna sh- <laughs> shit in your jodbus. You hear me? I'm gonna sh- shit in your jodbus. It makes you wear them. Make you gallop on your handsome horse, you hoof. Off the downstairs, Dixie hole fills up with my belly leavings. <laughs> Charlie knew he had to flee, but it wasn't just fear that froze him. His legs were literally numb. He couldn't even wiggle his toes. He realized it must have been the urine. The foul liquid had somehow paralyzed him. There was no escaping these bestial taunts. Tears ran down his face and tumbled into the menacing pillowcase. Oh, oh, I can taste them. I can taste your weapons raining down on me, cascading my tongue, swirling around the edge of my neck. Shoot. Keep crying, boy. Keep on crying for your first pair of pal. Please stop. We're gonna have so much fun together, Charlie. You and me. We's gonna eat beans and cornbread and laugh at cripple folk. Oh, yes. I'm gonna make you strangle a Frenchman at a baseball game. And we'll wrestle. We'll wrestle coon dogs for sport. And if you lose, I'll untie your belly button and unravel your stomach. So you's gonna have to carry around your guts in a wooden bucket named Sally. Who are you? You know my name. Go on. Say it. No. Say it. Say my name. Billy Possum. A single swing. 
swipe of his claw, and the wordy vermin extricated himself from the pillow. Charlie recoiled as much as his motor nervous system would presently allow. <laughs> He halted, halted before Charlie and stared him down, naked, free, and alive. He fashioned his 50 fangs into a grin. You wanna know? You wanna know who I is? I'm just an ordinary old opossum, straight from the Ozarks. I was just a skittering across a juniper hillock to meet with my old lady so I can rub up all on her 13 fuzzy titties. But I never got there. Little round bullet pierced my lung and all my gut color done fell out. But I didn't die. I was captured by a tasteless inbred hillbilly sold to a factory. I remember them stripping off my heart like they was Eating a peach. I recall them yanking out my fixings, yanked them clean out, till I was as empty as a preacher's promise. They stuffed me back up with sawdust and straw, and I didn't die. I ain't never gonna die. And I do the same to you, Charlie Phelps. I'm gonna hunker you down and stuff you full of gubbins and doings, pull you on a fancy shelf, and we can be friends forever. You and me, we's gonna be king. Siblings, both our veins for the evil tree meat. In a fleeting gust of bravery, young master Charlie grabbed the approaching possum by its fur and deftly hurled it out the open window. <laughs> After the creature flew through, the window abruptly shut itself. Charlie released a sigh of relief. Then he reclined back on his bed. <laughs> we can never be parted, Charlie. You belongs to me now. I'm gonna own you for quite a spell. Years. Hundreds of years. Thousands of years. God walks the earth again and punishes us for our way. This time, Charlie was batting, swatting the intruder with his other pillow. The critter tumbled over the far edge of the foot of the bed. A futile gesture he knew, but it was instinctual. Sure enough, within seconds, it was crawling back up under the covers. A misshapen lump meandering below the sheets. Billy Possum inspected one of Charlie's feet, running his swollen nose up and down the ankle, sniffling up all the information he could. <laughs> it ain't ready yet. It ain't cool proper. Mm -hmm. She still needs to ferment. Yes, um, she needs a lot more ferment before I can attack this kid. He let the foot fall from his paws. Then he mounted the leg like a witch on a broomstick, using the boy as a ladder to crawl back to the top. Yeah, come Billy Possum skin. Yeah, two drinks here. I'm going gin. <laughs> the beast plopped down on Charlie's chest. The tip of its deformed snout crested from the edge of the bed sheets. I'm all gonna hurt you real bad, Lollipop. By now, the paralysis had spread. Charlie couldn't even swat the villain away. His little hands flapped about like fish out of water. But he could feel the possum laying on his ribcage and smell its hot, acrid breath as it spoke from under its cowl. You hear me? I'm not gonna pull out your teeth and nail them to a kitty cat. I'm gonna saw off your legs and beat your mama to death with them. Beat your mama to death with your own legs? Your brothers and sisters is gonna cry. They're gonna blame you, yes, sir. <laughs> 
He wouldn't do that. Billy finally <laughs> crawled out of the sheets and pressed his face against Charlie's. I'm gonna reach in your mouth and chew on your uvula. Not eat it, mind. Just kind of gnaw on it like a dog with a soup bone. You wouldn't. You don't want to hurt me. Or you, you would have already. You were just trying to scare me. Billy Possum pulled back and gawked at the boy in a sort of shock. Then he got his muzzle up real close again. Are you calling me a liar, pumpkin toes? Hmm? You postulating Billy Possum ain't got the gumption, the gumption to reach in you and chew on your juicy gullet plum. Stay away from me. The opossum clutched the edges of Charlie's mouth and stretched it wide. No! No! Billy Possum stuffed his head into the boy's mouth, locating the dangling flesh fruit at the back of the throat. The venomous vermin grasped it with his anterior fangs, and true to his word, he gnawed on it, never breaking the skin, but just chewing gently like it was a stick of gum, stretching it, rolling it around in his teeth. The horrid sensation combined with the taste of the matted, rubbish-smeared fur that coated his tongue. The wiry fibers permeated every interior surface of his mouth. Charlie cried and screamed for rescue. He begged for his teddy bear and he begged for his nanny. Bessie remained by her ward's door. She wept openly as she listened to him crying in the distance. Oh, Master Charlie, I run to your side if I could. You know that I would, but I'm forbidden. Your father is most insistent. I am indeed. Mr. President! Throwing another fit, is he? Good, good. Let him get it out of his system. Yes, Mr. President. The bear. Mr. President. Why do you still possess the bear? I thought I instructed you to incinerate the beast. Well, I, I saw no harm in keeping it. As long as young Master Charlie no longer... If that boy catches so much as a wink of that toy, we'll be thrown right back to square one. Oh, but sir, I have a sister back home. She's with child at the moment. I thought I could just send it back to Britain. Blasted woman, I ought to send you back to Britain. And with that, Taff snatched the teddy bear from her fingers and bounded down the hallway. I shall burn the mongrel myself. But what of young Master Charlie? He's fine. The boy was easily overpowered in his paralyzed state. The bedsheets were tied taut around his arms and torso. Billy Possum had rendered the stately canopied bed into a sort of makeshift gallows. The mattress was discarded to the floor. Charlie was strung up by his back. His bare feet, now slowly regaining responsiveness, dangled over a decorative antique chamber pot. <laughs> center apex of his scaffold, completing the knots that hoisted his poached cub. You play your cards right, you'll be prisoner someday. That's what your daddy said. He don't know how right he was. I'm -a gonna mold you, Charlie Phelps Taft. I'm -a gonna whittle you into the sharpest stick in politic. You already got a sharp mind. You already figured out I was fixing to make you scared. But you ain't caught on the why. See, I is distilling you. All that their fear is, is fermenting your fluids. It's all a bubbling and percolating in your veins. Almost ready now. Just a smidge longer. Can't wait to sink my teeth into your ugly ham hock and drink me a heaping snoop full. Oh, it's gonna be keen. Now I'm gonna milk a few jugs into that there piss platoon. Cause I wanna remember this fine day. The day I got my favorite toy. I'm not your toy. Not yet, you isn't. 
once I partake of your ankle, Jin, you will be inside me till kingdom come. And I'll be inside your head. Whoa. I'm gonna make you do terrible things. Drinking, cussing, gambling, smoking opium, killing women. You're gonna kill so many women, and a couple of men will too, I reckon. <laughs> I won't. I never will. You ain't having a choice, Poke Chop. I'm gonna control your mortal soul. You ain't no wild horse no more. You's about to be hitched up to my wagon. From now on, I take the reins. I say where you go. I say who you kill. Why, I reckon you'll be president forever. You'll abolish voting. Move the capital to the Ozarks. We's gonna bring back slavery. For everyone with less than 13 titties. <laughs> All through me. The immortal possum emperor of Mary. Oh. <laughs> I just want my daddy back. <laughs> Mr. President, this isn't necessary! William Howard Taft silently glowered upon the flames, deep in self-contemplation. This was why he was elected, he thought. This was his position in life. A president, a judge, a father. Someone had to make the difficult decisions. Someone had to determine what was permissible. What was not? Oh, the president bid Bessie good night and plodded off to bed. On Billy Possum's journey down the boy, he suddenly stopped. His marble eyes rolled backward in their ruts. Smoke billowed from his ears. His future pelt quivered. Yo, teddy bear is dead. What? He's dead. D-E-D, -D, dead. Your pa just done toasted him into furnace. No, he wouldn't. He promised me he wouldn't. Oh, he done it. Oh, oh, oh by gum, he done it. I can feel it right now. I can feel Teddy's fur and cotton burning away into nothing. No, he can't be gone. <laughs> you see this here flame? This is the very flame. Flame what consumed your teddy bear right here in the palm of my hand. And this is what it felt like. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That cooked up my ankle gin good properly. <laughs> I can smell it. Oh, she must be 175 proof. Maybe 180. Oh, me, oh, my. <laughs> As the fire raged behind him, Billy Possum focused on the ankle in front of him. The vampire varmint unsheathed his fifty filthy fangs, reared back his nit-festering head, and prepared to tap the cask. But the fire was being put out. Charlie's moistened, fire-bitten constraints began to loosen. With his paralysis now fading away, the boy lurched his arms and legs to free himself. The opposing opossum leapt from the flailing leg. With his acute night vision, he spied the figure in the darkness. Hovering nowhere nearby was a bright copper fire extinguisher. It suddenly dropped to the ground with a clang. The critter looked behind him, his pubescent
incandescent distillery had escaped the gallows. The boy scrambled into the far corner of the room. He was extinguished and unrestrained, but still terrified and defenseless. Perfect pickings for a foxy possum. It's still good. I can smell it. Oh, I'm a coomer for my Uncle Jenny Jim. <laughs> But he wasn't coming for his ankle, Jimmy Jim. Hairy tendrils had wound round his neck, choking the ill-gotten life out from his woolly cadaver. Come. I'm a coming to tap your bunghole. Inch by inch, Billy Possum clambered toward Charlie, gouging his claws through the historic rug. All the while being choked and dragged in reverse, the one-man cavalry responsible for the rescue stepped into the light. Father? Ballyho! Charge! Teddy? Yes, Charlie, it's me. You wouldn't think I'd leave you in a spot of bother like this, do you? Teddy! It is you! Shut up! Stop giving him hope! You was ruining my hopes! However, the tensile strength of a possessed mustache was of little help against a haunted opossum who crept ever closer to his cornered prey, furiously scrabbling his claws at Charlie's exposed feet. The president's facial hair just barely held the monster at bay. This is all my fault! I'm sorry I let them take you, Teddy! Fault? <laughs> sorry? You've nothing to be sorry for, lad. I'm proud of you, and that pride shall never falter, Charlie. Charlie smiled, and his pursuer recoiled as it realized the entire fermentation process was for naught. The blood was cleansing, and the ankle was strong. The boy kicked <coughs> his leg. Billy Possum tumbled backwards right into the <coughs> antique chamber pot. Teddy and Charlie <coughs> slammed the lid down over it. What shall we do with him? Oh, just let nature take its course, I suspect. That rascal! Spoiling my chin! Why, I'm on... What's that? What's that? Some, some frying up some pickled pork knuckles. Billy Possum wasn't alone in the chamber pot. He shared it with a scrap of burnt nightgown. His final ember gently kissed a single wiry strand of hair emanating from the animal's ass. Bridges! Bridges and boiling and dying! The boy and his father's mustache struggled to hold the lid down on the porcelain basin. It was as hot as an oven and bucking like a bronco. The edges licked with smoke and flames and desperate little paws. Just as I said, eh? Things always take a turn for the better in the end. Cautiously, they opened the lid. When the smoke cleared, they found the remains of Billy Possum. There wasn't much left of him. A wire frame, marble eyes, teeth and claws. They put the lid back on. Charlie turned and asked a question that he feared. Can we be friends again now? Oh, Charlie, I'm afraid I'm just barely clinging to this spectrum of existence by the skin of my teeth. I lost my physicality, you see. Then I leapt into the closest furry creature I could find. Had to hold on just a little longer, you see, for you. But I confess, I am overdue to meet my maker. Your father is about to awaken, and then I shall have to vacate his mustache. And from there, I shall go the way whence I shall not return. <laughs> but I need you, Teddy. Oh, pish. You no more need me than you need another hole in your head. I saw how you routed that founder. You'll soon grow up to be a fine young man. Yes, sir, quite soon. And fine young men don't need their teddy bears. The graying tresses embraced the traumatized child. His tears rolled across the curved track of follicles. Then the hair slowly retreated, retracting back into the sleeping president's face. Bally -ho. Charlie was left sat in the debris of his newly allocated White House bedroom. He continued to gently weep, even more so when he realized his father was about to awaken. This was too much for him, he thought. He wasn't ready to grow up. Life was unfair, life was cruel, and only... <laughs> Charlie barred down the skeletal remains of Billy Possum escaped confinement. He crawled in no particular direction and screeched nothing intelligent. So finally collapsing and 
crumbling to dust. There, there, son. We'll get you a new Billy Possum. Just four years later, William Howard Taft would go on to become a former president. And his son Charlie became the mayor of Cincinnati for a couple years. But what of Billy Possum? Some say he's still there, still haunting the White House, preying on vulnerable presidential children. They say JFK Jr. was once bitten by a ghostly creature. Bitten right in the Oval Office. And Trisha Nixon's Rose Garden wedding was almost called off because she was found the night before, scrabbling through garbage cans and hissing at bright lights. We'll never know the real truth. Not until it's too late. If it's not too late, I'd like to thank tonight's very special guest stars, Eileen Monty and Stephen Knowles. Monty is a hugely popular voice artist and singer. We're very lucky to have her for this. She played two extremely different roles exceptionally well. She's got a massive YouTube following, so you can go check her out on her channel. Stephen Knowles is a professional actor who's been in some great indie movies. He's played several old-timey characters, so I knew he'd fit well in this story. He's essentially doing impressions of both Taft and Roosevelt. And they're very accurate, which isn't easy because they both died before getting a podcast. I'd also like to thank the unsung hero of these films, Ryan Matiska, who composes and performs all the music. I've been making him do this for 20 years now, so I thought now would be a good time to thank him for the first time. He's in a great band called Catnap. I've seen them live. They're amazing. You can check them out on Facebook and, and, and hear them with, with, with your ears. And if you'd like to see us make more films, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and all that. And oh, by the way, did I mention we have t-shirts? For real, they're in my Zazzle store. You can buy one and, and walk around, and, and people will think you're some kind of goth dentist. Our next story is called The Fervent, and it takes place in space, which is where America keeps its other planets. <laughs>